to have a variable, right? For example, I could say conf equals uh, gets. Now, you know that in JavaScript, you declare a var for a variable. You don't have to do all of that. Coffee soup says, I'll take care of that declaration for you, so you don't have to declare a var in, in, in uh, coffee script. But I want to be able to display the name. What do you do in JavaScript to display stuff? You would, first of all, write a console, put a parentheses, and then you could say hello, and then you would say plus, and then how, how do you feel about that, right? That's kind of clumsy with all the plus and all that. And if you have a couple of things to put in place, it becomes really laborious to write, verbose to write it. Well, you don't have to do all of that in, in CoffeeScript. I'm going to simply put a little string here, and I'm going to say hello, and put a pound, and I'm going to simply say conf, right? Isn't that beautiful? Notice how beautifully it printed hello gets, right? No, it did not. What happened? That's because I put a single quote. A single quote is just a literal. That's what it is. But what I really want is a double quote. So if I put a double quote, it expands that for you. So a single quote literals, this is straight from Ruby. That's how Ruby behaves. So you have a single quote versus double quote. And if you are kind of curious, you say, you know what, that's kind of nice. But what is it producing? It produces the same old thing under the covers. That's the JavaScript compiled from CoffeeScript. So you run it, it produces the same result, but under the covers, it's the same JavaScript that you'd have written, but now it is less code, less effort to write it. Right? Make sense? So that is the expressions you can put, single quote versus double quote. And I mentioned earlier in my talk, if you were there in my talk previously, I was talking about why the triple quotes versus double quote. In JavaScript, you always, or most of the time, you want to use three, uh, sorry, not quotes, you want to use three equals to compare, and two equals is a, is a liberal comparison, most likely you don't want to do that. Well, in the case of coffee script, if I have a variable, you know, I can say, for example, um, if I have, let's say, uh, a value, I could say value equals uh, 2.0. So I could simply say, tell me if it's equal to 2.0, but what is value? I could say value equals uh, maybe a string with 2.0. So let's say this is double quoted 2.0, and this is just a value 2.0. And I want to output what this guy tells us. And notice in this case it says false. If you had typed this in JavaScript, you would have gotten a true at this point, right? You'd have to use three equals instead. Or you could also say, in this case, you could say, for example, value is uh, 2.0, and they both are equivalent, and you could use that. Similarly, if you want to compare the value one more time, this time I could, you know, send really a 2.0, and I can ask him to compare. So is and double equals are really one and the same, and guess what it maps to on JavaScript? The three equals. If you're not sure about it, don't worry about it, just run it to see, and you can see that it has three equals in it, right? That's one of the beauties. If you're not sure what code it produces, just ask him to produce the JavaScript and you can take a look at it. And so there's no surprise in that regard, right? So that is the ease, and you can take a look at what it does. I'm going to write an if condition. So let's see how we could write an if condition. Uh, what do you do in JavaScript? You use curly braces, right? And it kind of becomes noisy as you start writing curly braces. So what you do in CoffeeScript is, let's say age equals 18, and I could say, for example, if age is greater than or equal to 18, I'm going to say print out, what do I want to print out? You can vote. And I can also say else, console, uh, what can I say? Uh, go home kid, right? So we can try to run this and see how it works. And notice it says you can vote. Now notice I did not put a curly braces. I don't even have an end of that. Now of course, this is one of the slightly undesirable thing, is that indentation is sacred. So this knows that this is an if block by the indentation you put. The good news is you can indent it several levels, but you have to be consistent. And consistency is not a bad thing. But that's how it knows where this ends and where this be be begins. So it can, it can also say, you know, in here, be wise, right, as you would. And you can see that it really came part of that, and you can run through that also. If I change over here and just to 17, you can see the home kit, it doesn't print the other two parts. So you can write the if statement like that. But also at the same time, you can also prefer a bit of a you know, conciseness if you want, a little bit more conciseness. So for example, I could say age, 
And in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say console right line, and I can say you can vote, but I can also put if age is greater than or equal to 17. So you can see that in this case, I can put them all like that, as you can see here, and you can see that it says you can vote. Similarly, I can say here, uh, another one, uh, go home, and if age is less than uh, 18. So you can see that it can take that. Or you can say, unless age is greater than uh, you know, 17. So that unless part is not printed right now. If I change the age to 17, you can see that it can come in. Actually, this guy is trying to sneak in and vote. Change that. So a great one equal to 18, right? Yeah, there you go. So you can see that it says go home. That's because the unless part took effect. So you can say some code, and then you can say if or unless, so there's a bit of conciseness that you can take, make use of. In terms of scoping itself, it uses lexical scoping. I remember I said you don't have to put the var, and as a result, when you have a variable, it goes to the nearest definition of the variable to look for stuff. So if you're in a function, it takes the function definition. If you're not in a function, it reaches out to the function above the function, meaning if this is a nested function, and then reaches out to the You're going to write functions, but the syntax is much more simplified. The way you're going to write functions is very much like how you use um, in lambda expressions in, in languages, functional languages, how you use it. So for example, what kind of function would I like to define? So I want to write a function that's going to take a bunch of parameters and, and work with it. So we can maybe turn this into a function itself. So I can say my function is called uh, can I vote? And this is going to be a variable I'm assigning to. Um, there are two different ways to define functions in JavaScript. CoffeeScript kind of streamlines that. And so you can say age is the parameter I'm going to send to it. And now you can say, uh, you know, print, uh, you know, vote if age is greater than or equal to 18. And I can also say, uh, you know, no if age is, uh, unless, or you can say if, age is greater than or equal to 18. So in this case, notice how I define the function. I just create the variable equals to, that's a parameter list, and then you put the function. You could have put this function in the same line, but since I have two lines, I came down one level and wrote it. Notice the indentation that I have in this code, right? That's how it knows that these three lines belong to this function. And now if I want to call this function, I can call this function, can I vote? And I can send 18 in here, and it says vote. And I can also call, can I vote, and send 17 to it, and you can, you can see it says no. So that's how you can call this function effectively and, and, and you know, write this. So it becomes very easy to write this. And you can, of course, if you have conditions, more conditions, it will just indent multiple levels in there for you to work with. Uh, one of the biggest problems in JavaScript is arguments. And how do we really deal with arguments? Let's take an example here for a minute. So here I am in JavaScript right now. This is JavaScript. And in JavaScript, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write a function called max. And the max function is going to find the maximum of several values. Let's say A and B to begin with. So I could say here, I want to work with A and B. So if A is greater than B, uh, return. Do you notice that? In the coffee script, I never use the word return so far. And the reason is, in coffee script, unlike JavaScript, he likes that concept really well, as you can see. He plays music every time he enjoys something, so that's okay. Um, so you can see that when you have an exp uh, a statement, your statements have to execute, and if you want to return a value, you've got to set some variables and mess with it. In coffee script, everything is an expression. So whatever is the last expression you write, its result is automatically returned, so you don't never have to put a return statement. But I'm writing JavaScript right now, so I'm going to say else return b. So in this case, I don't even need an else, return b. So I could call max and send 2 comma 1, for example, and, and see what it really you know, returns to us. So in this case, oop, um, this, is called, this is JavaScript, remember? So I need to put a parenthesis around him and tell him what to do. And of course, I need a curly bracket also if I have multiple lines of code. Um, but what if I want to pass multiple parameters? Maybe I'm going to say comma 3 and 4 and 0. Now, of course, the answer is wrong. It gave us 2 because we only considered the first two parameters, right? If you want to do this in JavaScript, what you're going to do is you're going to remove this uh, list of parameters. And then within this, 
we're going to use what is called arguments. So just to kind of show you this, I'm going to say arguments and print arguments. So arguments uh, is the parameter list that you're receiving. And notice in this case, it's printing all the arguments you sent to it. But this is painful, isn't it? Because when you look at this function, the function doesn't take any parameters, but actually it is taking parameters, and the clarity is lost. So you wonder, is there a better way to do this? And this is where I'm going to do this. I haven't completed this code in here in JavaScript, but why waste the time doing that? Let's implement this in CoffeeScript. So notice what I'm going to do. I'm going to say you know, uh, max, and this is going to be the function. And what is it going to take? It's going to take numbers. But how many numbers? It's going to take as many numbers as you want to give it. So this is a splat operation you're going to perform. And basically, in this case, you're saying, print out the numbers for me. Just as an example, to begin with, let's do that. So I'm going to call max with 1 and 2. I'm also going to call max. You don't have to use parentheses if you don't want to. And I'm going to call max with, let's say, 1, 3, 2, 4, and 0, right? So you can see that it received an array of parameters under the covers. If you're so curious, you can take a look at the JavaScript it wrote again. And you can see that it is using the arguments that length under the covers. So it is using arguments, but our code became short and more expressive, right? That's the beauty of this. So now I can start using this. So what can I say here? I can say large equals, let's say, you know, zero. I know that's not the right answer. It could be any number in the range. Or you can say number zero to begin with. I could return the large value when I'm done. So this is going to really return to us only the first parameter, right? That's all it's going to return, which is wrong result at this point. It just returns one. But let's fix it. So what can we do now? I can say for a number in numbers, and now I can say large equals number if number is greater than large, right? So we can ask him now to find which number is large in this collection by simply looping through these, these values. So you can see how easy it is to write this code. It's very expressive, and we have a variable number of parameters. So rather than being the black magic behind the scene, it really exposes and says, let's make this very simple, more readable, easier to work with. Right? That's the beauty of this that you're seeing here. Um, so we looked at the splat operation, how we can use it. Now the beauty of the splat is you can use this to extract quite a number of parameters. Let's take a look at an example here. Maybe there's a little function called create stuff, right? And you're going to tell him how many stuff to create. So that's going to be n. And what's he going to return to you? He's going to return to you all the values between 1 and n. Just let's make this simple for us, right? So how is this going to work? a comma b equals create stuff 2. And I'm going to then print out, let's say, the value of a and b. So I'm going to print a and print b. So we ask him to create two stuff. And then we are asking him to just print those two stuff we created. Notice how easy it was, right? We created a collection of data. And what did it do? It assigned the values to the individual elements for us. So we don't have to really worry about sitting there and creating an array and then taking element 0, element 1. If you think that's really cool to do that, just take a look at the JavaScript code, and you're so happy you didn't have to do that. Right? So you can see how messy that can quickly become. Right? So of course, if you're a contractor, you're getting paid by the number of lines of code you write. Don't do that. Right? This is better. But if you want to get your work done and go home, this is really cool. But I'll tell you a secret. Never tell your boss you're using CoffeeScript. Right? That's which is the problem. Right? Use CoffeeScript and show the JavaScript you produced. Right? And the job says, oh my god, that's a lot of code you have to write. I'll give you a bonus. Right? So anyway, I didn't tell you that. Oh, I'm being recorded. Oh, my, damn it. OK. All right. So what do we do now? I'm going to say a comma b equals create stuff. And I said 3. And I'm going to go print the value now and see what we printed, right? So let's go ahead and say print these values. Notice what happened now. It got the value of a, it got the value of b. But what happened to the third value? Remember? Create stuff 3 is going to return us three values, right? So it just dropped and disappeared. And it's like, oops, wait a minute. I didn't really mean that. Please, can you give me that value? So yes, sure, we can be greedy about it and, and push the value into it. Notice I just wanted to write Ruby code right there suddenly. So you basically use the splat operation. 
And notice now B is the array that just sucked in that value and brought it in. So you can see how simple that was to use a splat operation. On the other side, you said, just print the collection of values for me. So this is a very powerful concept. And this also can go to a certain extent where you can have multiple parameters, but you can mix and match these things and, and work with it. So that's basically what these guys provide for us. With me so far? Yeah, so pretty easy. You have to write less code. Anybody has a problem writing less code? OK, yeah, so it's beautiful code. And, and nice, nice work to do. So what about arrays? So you can use arrays to work with stuff. So let's say nums equals uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. You could create it that way. Or if you're lazy like me, you just say 1 dot dot 6. So that becomes 1 through 5, right? 1 through, what, 1 through 6, right? So let's see what we got. Nums, and nums is 1 through 6. Um, what about this? That's 1 through 5. So you can either do an exclusive range or an inclusive range. So that is 1 to 5, and there is 1 to 6. So you can kind of go with the different range if you want to. But I want to really print out just the first element. So I'm going to say nums over here, and this is going to be the first element, so not, not a big deal. But I want a range of values. So how do I get a range of values? Nums 0 dot dot 3. So that gives me a value in the range, or 0 dot dot 2, that gives me the first three elements in the range. You could even say console, and you can ask in nums, go from 0 to minus 3 for me, please. So it starts counting from the other direction and gets you that number of values. So you can kind of get to these contents pretty effectively using the range object. But this leads us to something called a list comprehension. What is list comprehension? That's kind of a scary word. So when I hear scary words, I try to relate it back to something that I know. Maybe not to go over there. That's a scary location. Um, so something related to what I know already. So what is this comprehension? We all have used databases, right? So I have an employee table, and where they have employee names and addresses, phone numbers. So I would use a SQL query, and I would say select from employees where last name is Smith. Well, that's just a SQL query, SQL query on the database. Think of list comprehension as a SQL query on a data in a collection rather than a data in a database, right? And, and when I look at it that way, then I'm no, no longer scared about this term called list comprehension. So it is really a query on a data in a collection rather than a data in a table. So I have the data in this collection right now, and what do I want to do? Well, I want to loop through this. Let's kind of you know, march towards it. So for num in nums, and I can print out the value of the num right here. So it's going to print one value at a time. Again, notice we're using the indentation in the for loop, right? But I don't want to do that. What I would really like to do is to only print out even this even, right? So equal to 0. So you can see our uh, is 0. So notice how I wrote this now. I said for a very num, for num in nums, when num is even, so that is going to pull out only even numbers for us from this collection. What did I do wrong? Oh, uh, it's two. What, what a picky audience. Why don't you just bring people who accept what I write? Okay, thank you for your help. Okay, e is, what do I say, e is zero, right? right? I'm hungry, guys. That's what it is. All right, there you go. So that's even numbers in the collection. But that basically is the um, um, miscomprehension, right? So notice it's like a query. So you're saying nums for nums in this collection when nums is even. So you can do a query of this. Similarly, if I want to double the values in the collection. So I can say num times 2. Isn't that wonderful? But what is num? For num in nums, or uh, when num, I remember now, 2 is 0, right? And you're saying, get me all the even numbers, and once you get all the even numbers, go through the even numbers and get me a collection of those even numbers, and then double each one of them. And, and so, did it do the job? Yeah, 2 times 2 is 4, and the next even number is 4, 4 times 2 is 8. So you can see the collection going, yes, please, please. Uh, it's going to cost you five bucks. 
<laughs> Absolutely. So right there is the JavaScript for it. And you're so happy you didn't have to write. Okay, writing that code in JavaScript is like going here. Now it doesn't do it. All right, cool. <laughs> All right. So that is basically what miscomprehension is. Um, what about JSON representation? So what is JSON representation? Well, JSON is a lightweight object, right? We all we have used JSON, right? It's a very simple object. How do you create a JSON object? So person equals, and you put a curly bracket, remember? That's, how, that's what you do in JSON. And then you say first, and what is first? I'm going to say John. And then you say last, and you say Joe, or uh, Bill. And now you ca you've got an object of person, and you can print person out. Um, so that kind of looks like JavaScript, right? And, and you say, well, but this has got to be simple. Remember, I didn't write the var. You say, no, I want more. Okay, fine. So how about this? Person equals first is uh, you know James, and last is Bond, of course. And this is the James Bond style of writing it. So now I can say person, and that is another JSON object. So you can leverage the indentation to write this. And look at the beauty of this. This itself could be another object, and then you can do one more level of indentation on it, and you're defining the sub-object into it, and so on, right? So you can definitely write code like that. So again, a very lightweight syntax. It doesn't force you to use curly bracket. So potentially, you could write entire coffee script where you have absolutely no curly braces, and then let the compiler generate the curly braces under the covers for you. So they both are equivalent, but as you can see here, you don't have to really use that. So that's a JSON representation done fairly well. How are we doing on time? I forgot to turn on my clock here. How many more minutes do we have? Can somebody help me? If you don't tell me, we'll keep going until I finish. Half hour. All right. Excellent. So um, how do we create classes and use inheritance in the code? Right? That's the next thing we want to talk about. So in JavaScript, how do you create classes? So if you want to create classes in JavaScript, um, you are writing objects in JavaScript to create classes. That's, that itself shakes your faith, right? Because it's, you, you really don't see a class when you create it. So it can get very messy. And then you have to deal with prototypes. So you're going to do something like this, right? You're going to say var vehicle equals function. That's your constructor. And then here you will say this dot miles equals miles when you want to send an initial miles as a variable. And in, in most of the languages, I would scream if somebody says this dot a property. I hate that notation. That's ugly, right? And if this gets, by the way, this is JavaScript. I just want to make sure, right? Uh, anything you look ugly is JavaScript. I don't have to say that again, right? So that's JavaScript. And um, so then, how do you use inheritance in this case? You would say a var car equals function, and then you would say ear, and then you would here say this dot ear uh, equals ear. And then it gets even more complex as things go on. You have to then be able to relate and say car dot prototype equals new vehicle. And that's how you say that they inherit from, right? And by the time you do all of this, it gets very messy in JavaScript. And what do you do normally when things get so messy? You give it to somebody else to maintain it. No, I'm just kidding. So when it gets really messy, you say, well, I'm going to wrap all this into a, into a higher level function so that I don't have to call that repeatedly, right? Or you then end up using something like jQuery, which wraps all that into higher level functions, and you can use it. But, but why should it be so hard to use? It shouldn't be that hard to use, right? So let's create a class in, uh, in CoffeeScript, class of vehicle. So notice that I just wrote a class. And my, my years of abuse with curly braces kind of showed up there for a you know, microsecond there, as you can see. So we wrote a class called vehicle. And I want to say miles equal to 0. Or maybe I want to initialize the miles. You could do that if you want to, right? So what do, where do I initialize the miles? So I say constructor, and what is the constructor going to do? It's a function, and I'm going to say miles equal to zero. You already are catching on to this, right? What does at you think? It's this. It's this, that's correct. It's this dot. So it gave you the context. Isn't that cool? 
right? And again, that's straight from Ruby, but you don't have to say this dot. And so within an object, within an instance method, at is the this context. Outside of the function, at is the class context. So that becomes your static variable rather than your instance variable. So a few minutes ago when I put at miles, that is class context. It's static, not an instance, right? With me so far? So now we created it. What do I want to do? If I want to create a vehicle, I could do that. But I'm interested in creating a car. And what does car do? Extends a vehicle. And notice how the indentation paid off here, right? So we know that constructor is part of the class and that line of code is part of the constructor. Happy with that? So now we created a car which inherits from vehicle. And what am I going to do in the car? Constructor, and I'm going to take an year as a parameter. I want to know when this car was created. And what am I going to do? Year equals year. And I also want to say color of my car. Tell me an ugly color for a car. Pink. <laughs> you think so? OK, well, if the lady says it, I'm with her. I'm with her. I mean, usually, you know, ladies get offended. What do you mean? We love pink. That's why I wanted to check. Um, OK, pink is good then. All right. So let's go ahead and create a car. What do we do? Car 1 equals uh, new car 2012. So let's play with this car. And I'm going to say car one dot, let's just print the car and see. I've made a mistake, by the way. And let's see what the mistake shows. I'm just printing the car. What happened? Yeah, the miles kind of disappeared. Where is the miles? So within the constructor, I say super. What does that do? It calls the base class constructor or the same method with the same name rather, right? Now, if I put a parentheses, it is going to call with no parameters. This is a little bit of a glitch you have to be careful with. You are saying, don't send anything. But if you don't put the parentheses, it is going to send the year to the base class constructor, which it's simply going to ignore at this point, right? So basically, and I mean, it's like, show me the JavaScript, fine. Anybody wants that? No. OK. So right there, it passed it down the chain. But look at the simplicity, right? And you know, please. Yeah, like, uh, I think so it's like I'm just trying to map it to Java function. Uh-huh. Without the, without the, but, but still retaining the prototypal inheritance. Okay. Keep that in mind. This is not inheritance like Java. Okay. It's inheritance as JavaScript. Well, okay. But yeah, all the magic, the prototype magic happens under the covers. If you, if you, I mean, you know, you need to do something for Friday night, right? So your job, your assignment for this Friday night is to write coffee script, compile it to JavaScript, and study the JavaScript. And then you can compare and see what it's doing. It's doing, it's compliant to JavaScript. So it'll create the prototype object and, and set it. That's what it's doing. It's not, it's not, it's not inheritance like Java. It's inheritance as in JavaScript, certainly. That prototypal inheritance. Um, and so right there, you saw the miles pop up now, and you, and you have the value on hand, right? Se seems reasonable, right? So you're able to write that. OK, but I do want a function. What kind of function do I want on this, on this class? Um, I'm going to write a function called drive. So drive is a function. I'm going to give him a distance. And what does it do? He's going to simply say, you know, driving. And then I'm going to specify the distance it's going to drive. So distance. Oh, that's got to be a double quote because I want it to be an expression, right? So right there, it's an expression that I'm writing. Oh, let's go ahead and call that call one dot drive, and uh, 10 miles is what I want to drive. So you can see it says driving 10, and it displays that. So you can see how we are able to define a function within that. But, but there are times when you may want to come out of the class and define functions on it. So I'm outside the car class. One of the nice things about JavaScript is you can add methods to existing classes. So if I want to add a method to this class outside, how would I do that in, in JavaScript? I have to from here say car.prototype.drive equals. That is an extra noise that you have to go through, right? Instead, you simply say car colon colon and turn. 
and then you could say this method is direction and then you could say simply turn uh, and then we'll say turn whatever direction it is. Did I type it right? T U R N, turn. And the direction is direction we want to turn. So you can see how easy that is to write that function. Let's go ahead and call the turn function. So call one dot turn, uh, let's say right. Right? So we can ask him to turn right at this point and see that he is turning right. So that's an example of how you could define functions outside the class, please. Right, on the instance itself. So yes, so you can go to the car, uh, car one dot prototype, you can change the content at that point. We have another prototype. So you copy the different, it's, uh, the same yeah, yeah, you just say dot and then specify the type and then specify and ask it to change it. So that is basically uh, a class and inheritance. Uh, and you saw the at symbol already, right? That gives you the symbol to refer to the this value. And similarly, you know, I want to keep track of the number of cars that I have in my application. So we'll say, uh, oh, not there, in the car itself. So we'll say cars uh, count equals, count equals zero. So let's go ahead and ask him to tell us what the car count is. How do I do that? So I'm going to say here, uh, car dot cars count. So I'm asking for the cars count. Notice it is zero to begin with, right? So we created no cars. So the cars count to zero. Let me delete these things so you can just focus on just the code we want to focus on. So number of cars is zero. And then what am I going to do? I'm going to say uh, car one equals new car, and I'm going to say 2012. And now I want to know how many cars exist. So I'm going to go back here and say, tell me how many cars exist. Hey, what happened to the car we created? We, it, it's kind of disappeared, right? So what do you do? You can come down to this guy and say, you know, car dot cars count is equal to uh, plus plus, right? You're incrementing the value of the cars count. So you can see the static context taking, excuse me, effect in this case. How is this working really? If you look at the JavaScript itself, you will notice that the count that you created is actually part of the car function itself rather than being part of the prototype. So what's part of the prototype belongs to the instance. What's part of the function itself, you can still reach out and access it from there. So this is good news and bad news, right? It's good news, why? Because it's a consistent syntax. It's a bad news because you have to know the context in which you are. In this case, the context is within an instance. In this case, the context is within the class. And, and, and I don't know about you, but I, I find it a little difficult to kind of switch that in my head sometimes. Um, in, in Ruby, you use two at symbols to specify a, 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 a static uh, variable. Uh, of course, Ruby also has the problem, when you use the word self, you need to remember the context in which you are. Uh, that kind of trips me off from time to time. It's not, it, maybe it's not the language fault, but it's my fault, but it still does that to me, right? So be just a little you know, careful about it. You've got to know where you are in this context and be able to switch into it. So, Sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, like, can you have uh, static functions? Oh, absolutely. So I want to, uh, you know, uh, uh, have a function, I don't know, uh, call that um, foo uh, equals, and then you define a function on the class itself. So the foo function, right? You called foo. So, um, so that's basically, uh, in this case, I can just say call dot foo. That's just a, a you know, static context at the point. It doesn't have any. Oh, that's one thing I want to mention here which is kind of a little is strange. Remember we said we don't have to do parentheses? Well, that's only true when the function takes parameters. When a function doesn't take parameters, you have to still say parentheses. Because it's, it's, whether it's, you're applying the function rather than mentioning the function pointer in a sense. So that you have to. But that's the way you would call into it. Can we the static within the oh, you bet you. So you can, instead of doing this, you simply, let's just grab this function for a second, right? the foo function, and you basically go in here, and how do you say that this belongs to the class? So this is going to be at, right? At foo equals, uh, and specify this function as a class function. And again, the at really is a context. Uh, this is a class context rather than 
object context, and then that's where you're driving off of that. Yeah, absolutely, you can do that, yeah. So, um, that's great, but one of the things that we have to be very, uh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, so, in JavaScript, you have this uh, public property and then this property and other things that come to the picture, right? Like, like a big function or together. It's the same way that works with JavaScript as well. When you use this Anderson sign, that you have this public property being exposed outside and something else whereby I can make it more private within the whole function. Itself. JavaScript itself doesn't have private at all, actually. Um, yeah, you have to kind of work around to make things private. There's no real concept. Everything is public in JavaScript. Uh, same concept here. It doesn't try to hide anything away from you. So it's not going to provide you any more help in that regard. But of course, if you declare things within functions, then it becomes that context. So that won't be available, visible outside of it. And that's the point, though, is if you define a variable within a function and don't put var, it becomes global. Whereas in the case of CoffeeScript, it becomes local to it. That, that, that absolutely, yeah, that takes care of that for you, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep, go ahead, please. I'm sorry, say that again. How do we create a global variable? Um, you stay with me after. Rest of them don't have to be corrupted with the such thoughts. Well, global variables are evil, so don't do that. Yeah. How does it simplify closer? Simplify what? A closure. Yeah, closure is done. Right there you have a closure, right there, line number seven, right? Uh, it's, it's a function is a closure, and, and so that's pretty lightweight. You can pass that certainly to other functions uh, very easily. Uh, so that becomes uh, a closure for you to pass around. Uh, and you can also receive closures. There is, the JavaScript doesn't care about those things. It's a very lightweight language, right? So there's no special syntax for defining closures unlike other languages. Uh, you can just create like that. That's a, that's a closure right there. And, and functions are created using closures. So coming to this point, like global uh, variables, so like uh, variables in the simplified variables, like that's the like lexical scoping. So it's defined wherever you are defining the variable. The first time you hear whatever you write is inside the namespace. It does provide you a way to escape out of it, but it's not recommended you do that too often. So generally, don't think about global because that's evil, and you have to redesign your code not to do that. That's a very poor programming practice in itself. Um, Can this uh, be used along with uh, absolutely. So in in CoffeeScript, you could actually use any JavaScript library you want to, because remember, your code is compiled down to JavaScript, and and so what's going to happen is if you call into jQuery or whatever, you're going to use the CoffeeScript a code to call into the JavaScript. But when you compile it, it's JavaScript calling into JavaScript at the end of the day, right? So as a result, it makes no difference at all. You're just using a lightweight syntax to call into it, that's all. So absolutely. And that's why this is a, it's, a, it's a really taking the source code and compiling into JavaScript. So it's a language level, you know, transliteration. That's what you're doing really, right? And there are some technical terms people begin to throw around, but it's basically source code to source code. That's what it is. Uh, say that again? No, 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 no. So there are library, again, this is, you don't want anything in CoffeeScript because the running execution is JavaScript, not CoffeeScript. Right? So you can call into anything you want to. If somebody wrote the library code in CoffeeScript, it doesn't matter because you kind of see it as JavaScript on your side anyways. You're not reaching into it and calling it. Yes. Well, again, you're, you're not realizing this it never runs. It produces job. You know, that's kind of the whole thing you have to cross in your mind. CoffeeScript is never executed. It's a JavaScript that executes. So if JavaScript can do something, the code you produce from CoffeeScript can do that too. Because CoffeeScript is not the runtime. It's a JavaScript that's a runtime, right? Yep. Uh, no, it's not an unfair comparison, but I generally don't talk about evil things. Okay. <laughs> um, shall we move on? 
All right. So um, we'll talk about viewability separately. I mean, I love Google, but I have special feelings about viewability. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, uh, there's a gentleman who created it. There's a community around it. Google for it. Find information. Um, okay. So um, what do we do with this? We oh, so the point I wanted to make here was that. Um, Notice this, this is kind of redundant, right? You have to set the year variable explicitly. You don't have to do that. And instead you say, why don't you do this? And you simply put the at in front of the parameter. And, and the effect is the same. And what, what's going to happen in this case is that within the function, I don't know if I'm able to see the function here, it basically sets that up here for you, right? So um, that's basically. Uh, a notation that says just do a little assignment. I don't have to be spending the time and effort, you know, creating it. Um, so accessing the prototype outside the class, I already showed that to you. What if I want to go through and loop through each of these values and print the values? How do I do that? So let's take this car object one more time, uh, and let's say we create an object of car. Let's actually simplify this a little bit. So what I want to do here is. Uh, I have a color and I have a, a, um, a value for color and I have a value for ear, right? So for key comma value, and I'm going to specify at this point, uh, where is this? So of car one, oh, I don't have car one. So car one equals new car, and let's say 2012. So I'm going to ask him for this information. And what am I going to print? I'm going to print at this point the key and I'm going to print the value. So basically, in this case, the value. So in this case, oops, what did I do wrong? Uh, key, right? Oh. So in this case, now what did it do? Notice it printed the year, the color, the miles, and also printed the constructor. Um, you could do a little bit more work, and I'll show you a better way to do this in a few minutes. If uh, type of um, the key or the value uh, isn't, you don't want it to be, right? Function. So you can ask him, only print things that are not, instead of, instead of is, you say isn't. So you could, you could do that. Um, so this is getting you the key and value pairs, but instead of doing that, you could also say key in or off, car one, and you can just print the key itself. So this is going to just get you the properties, right? But you say, I don't want all the properties. I only want the properties that belong to this guy. Own property. So this is going to get you only the property. If I can type, there we go. And, and JavaScript has what's called has uh, you know, uh, uh, ownership or, or has own. So basically, you're, here you're saying own key to say only get me my own properties, not properties from other you know, uh, locations. So you can. Say that again. So in the constructor, you're not the right here, right? You did. Right there. That's the, that's the short syntax I talked about, right? Yep. Um, so you're looping through the properties, getting the values out, and we saw this. That's all I have. Thank you. So, uh, let's wait for people to leave the room. They're in a rush. Then we can talk. Thank you, Vic. Thank sure. you for that great chat. Um, right, uh, everyone, the um, next session will actually commence at 2.30. And that's um, a keynote in the main hall. Okay. And then after that, we're going to have the Great Indian Developer Awards, um, the uh, season five of that. So please don't miss that. That's in the main hall at to uh, 3.10, and then we're going to commence uh, the five-track sessions. Have a lovely lunch and see you after. You know, let's give people a... Uh, those are in a rush.